Well, the, the purpose of this museum was to try to preserve everything that I could of the equipment and the legends of uh, letterpress printing. The museum is set up so that the part on the left is a typical, typical country town shop from this barrier over here with the things that you would find in any old shop, not necessarily in this same order. The portion over here is uh, composed of pieces of equipment that are now obsolete, although they're still operational, they're obsolete, and uh, show some of the things that at one time were necessary in letterpress printing. On the, on the walls, I have a number of early uh, historic newspapers, of which I have several hundred front pages that can be put up there and changed from time to time as necessary. Then in the, in the back room are the back issue files of most of the pioneer country town weeklies. That is the Palouse Republic, the Rosalia Rustler, Rosalia Citizen Journal, Endicott Index, and others of similar nature. In the uh, room over here, uh, mostly early magazines, uh, also catalogs, the instruction manuals for farm equipment and things of, of this nature. So in essence, that's the general uh, setup. And I thought perhaps what it could do now is to show how a, a country town paper was put together from a uh, handset to linotype and uh, finally putting the paper to bed on the, on the press. Well, in the early days of, uh, of printing, that is, once they got movable type, where you had individual uh, pieces of type, which are called sorts, uh, the uh, man that was doing the typesetting, the printer, would set type in a, a stick, which was actually a stick, but now is, is metal. And he could set his lines to any length that he wanted to by simply moving the knee. Then he would come to his uh, type uh, case. This is the cabinet. These uh, so-called drawers are called type cases and uh, from this the man could start setting type and uh, just simply put them in the stick one after another until he had the stick full of the particular size type that he wanted. He could use uh, pieces of lead, thin pieces of lead, which are called leads in the trade, and uh, to use for spaces between lines. They would put uh, one case which had all capital letters in it. He would put up on the top. The other case which had just the small letters would put on the bottom. And that's where we would get the term the uppercase letters and, and lowercase letters come from that uh, practice of the, of the printers. Now then as soon as he had a stick full, he would move over to this table which is covered uh, has a, a stone top and is referred to as the stone or the imposing stone. He would unload his, his type in, uh, slide it off into a tray, uh, a metal tray called a galley, and then go back and set type some more until he had uh, enough type for the whole column or if he's setting an ad, had the ad completed. Then, as soon as he has gotten his, um, all his galleys full and is ready to, to make up his page, he moves over to another stone next to it where there's a, a steel frame called a chase. And he puts his, all his type in the chase till he has a chase completely full and then locks it up. And I'll go into the details of that uh, subsequently. Well, this was a very slow method of setting type, and sometimes that the uh, newspaper man would have to set a page, print it, and then redistribute all the type back in the cases before he could set the next page. So it was a long, slow process. Well, as a result of all this, then uh, a man by the name of Mergenthaler invented and developed uh, the linotype, which is this machine over here became necessary ultimately to develop 
or at least desirable, to develop some type of machine for setting type faster. And there were quite a few attempts made to develop typesetting machines. The most successful of these uh, was the Mergenthaler Linotype invented in 1886. Now this is uh, not the earliest model, but it's a 198 model, uh, Model 5, and one of the very early ones. Now the, the thing that is done here is to substitute a, a metal die. This is a brass die, a female die in uh, brass. And from this are letters cast in the line. Now in, in this machine, you see that there's a magazine that contains a large number of these mats or mattresses as they're called in the plural. They lie up in this position up in here. And when the operator sits, sits down to operate, it has a keyboard, which is not exactly like a, line of uh, like a typewriter keyboard, but he's, he sits here and uh, he has the small letters, the lowercase letters here, the uppercase letters on this hand, uh, the numbers and the punctuation marks and so on in the middle. And as he sits here and operates, he doesn't uh, plunk as you might on a typewriter, but merely touches with his fingertips. And as he touches one of these keys, one of these little paws, like so, which is lined up here, a whole row of them in a box, lined up here, and, they, and the roller is moving constantly. As he touches that key, it actuates this, this paw. That, in turn, actuates a rod and then releases one of these mats from the magazine that comes down in through here, down into a stick, like so, with the die face in. Well, he keeps on operating until he gets to the length of line that he wants, and I'll just substitute a, a set of these mats, putting that in the, in the stick. Now then, he's got the line the length that he wants it. He merely raises this up like so, and that brings the mats to this position. And since this machine isn't operating, I'll have to show you what happens manually. Now then, as soon as that's in position, this is the mats are carried over here, brought down against a, a mold wheel, as you see here. Normally this is closed. Uh, it's just cut away now to show you how it operates. So this is, these mats are lined up in this fashion against an opening in the, in the mold. This being the mold wheel, this the mold. As soon as that has gotten into position and fixed, a pot of molten metal is moved forward and molten metal is squirted into this space against these dies and cast then a line which looks like so and as soon as it's cast it would be in this position as you see there. As soon as it's cast then this wheel automatically rotates, comes down into this position and while it's turning the back of the slug is trimmed off so it's just the height of one of these uh, pieces of type, letters of type. Then as soon as it's gotten into this position a blade, ejector blade, which lies right behind here, I'm touching it now, moves out, uh, kicks that slug out into this galley, and it's then ready to use. Then, as soon as that has been cast the, and trimmed, the wheel moves back here, and simultaneously the uh, group of mats are raised up by this elevator, brought into position here, moved over to this spot, and you can't see it from where you are there now, but you'll have to move around here. There's an arm that comes down, has a couple little flaps. That arm comes down, takes hold of these mats, brings them to this position, and they're pushed along by this rod assembly 
along that track and moved along by means of these uh, worms uh, on the top of the machine. And ultimately, since each of these is keyed, it'll move along to a point where there's nothing to hold it any longer. And the individual letters then will drop off, or the mats will drop off into the proper channel in the magazine, and they're ready to, to, to go again. Now all of this is controlled by a series of cams uh, of different shapes and I think, I don't know whether you can see them here or not, but it's operated by a series of cams which are so delicately, delicately integrated that you can have two or three operations going on simultaneously. Well then as soon as the, the uh, linotypist has gotten this galley full, He'll just simply bring it over to the saw, and knowing what the length of the, of, the, of the column is in his newspaper, he'll just put it on here, move it through the saw, cut to the proper length, and bring it over again uh, to the stone and prepare to put it into the chase. Now then, sometimes they also want to include uh, photographs or cuts of one kind or another, such as you see here, this type of an illustration. They want to, to include those in the paper as advertising or illustrations of one kind or another. And to, to make these metal plates, they have a, a stereo caster, and stereo merely means an image, like your, your stereo music machine and so on. As, now then, this, operates in this, this manner. Into this is put a, a paper mache mat or mattress of this type, or mattresses of this type, are put down on the bed of the, of the stereo caster, held down by these bars, and the cast will be the thickness of these bars. On some uh, machines, some stereo casters, it's possible to, to cast to the full height of uh, the type, a uh, piece of type, such as with this electrical, uh, electrically operated stereo caster. Now then, as soon as he's got his mat in place, the printer or stereo caster uh, locks up the device and keeping in mind or being reminded that this pot is filled with molten type metal which is composed of lead tin and copper sometimes antimony and he merely brings it to this position pulls this lever down and molten metal comes down into the uh, stereo casting uh, section of the device. Then he breaks it open, and he would come out then with uh, something like this as a stereo casting of the object, whatever it was, on the uh, stereo mat. Then that is taken, and using a block of hardwood, uh, such as birch or maple, uh, not oak or hickory, but birch or maple, something like that, or cherry, the mat is then fitted uh, to the block, either pinned in with small brads or glued on, and that then goes into the form and is ready then to uh, be printed. Now there are several things about terminology and printing that you might uh, be interested in. Uh, one that I didn't mention when we started was that the print shop used to be called a chapel in the early days and has very little relationship to a, a true religious chapel. Also there are terms that I think I mentioned before, this is the imposing stone and the stories are told that at one time the printers used to go out to cemeteries and steal the headstones, turn them upside down and use them for their, uh, their stones in the, in the shop. Then there's the term pie which is spelled either P-I or P-I-E and that's just a mixture of type that uh, isn't in any order at all. It's just, just mixed, and that's called pie. If you happen to 
to take and, and uh, drop that line, uh, you've pied it. Or if you take a complete page that's been assembled and drop that, you've pied the, the case or the, the chase as far as that goes. Then there's also the, the terminology of furniture, which means something different to a printer from what it means to the housewife. The larger pieces of wood, like so, or metal of this type, used for filling in spaces in, a, in an ad or on any printed page, that's referred to as furniture. Also, what is used are wooden spacers, uh, thinner spacers, and this is referred to and called reglet. Then you have uh, metal uh, spacers of this type, uh, from very thin to, to rather thick pieces, and these are referred to as, as leads. Well now, once the printer has gotten his material together in, uh, in, the cha in the galleys, it could be metal type, it could also be wooden type, such as you see here. And these are used because they're much lighter than pieces of metal type of the same dimensions, and they're used for big headlines, for ads, and for such purposes as that. Then the printer comes over here to, the, to this stone, where he has a metal frame called a chase in which he assembles or makes ready uh, his page for printing. Uh, when he first puts his material in there, this, uh, the material is rather loose in there, and so he has to lock it up. And to lock it up, he uses metal wedges called coins, Q-U-O-I-N-S, coins. And he puts them in here, a row along this side, one along the bottom, and then he locks it together uh, with a key of this type or a key of this type, a coin key. And he locks that up very tightly uh, before he's finished. But until, before he gets completely locked uh, up tight, what he does is to uh, take a mallet and a planer and uh, go over and make sure that all the type is uh, sitting in such a way that the type, uh, each piece of type is on its feet. And so that's his purpose. Otherwise, it gives an incompleted printed line or pokes holes in the paper or damages the type or the press. Now then, when he's got it all planed, he locks it up either with these metal coins or they used to use wooden wedges in place of metal coins, and these were put together with a shooting stick. They were put together in such a way as that, and with a, 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 another wedge against it, they would drive against the, the wedges, tighten it up that way with a, a shooting stick. Now then, that form is locked together and uh, should be very tight. He's got to be able to, to uh, lift that up and carry it, so he can't have anything loose. Now then, uh, this is extremely heavy, weighing probably 50 pounds or so, and that has to be carried from the stone down to the big press without dropping and pieing it. And so now I think we're ready to put the paper to bed. Well, we've, <coughs> we've finished our make ready, gotten the, the form all locked up, and now we brought it down here and laid it on the press along with another form of the same kind to, so we can print up two pages simultaneously. And these forms, of course, have all the linotype material in them. The, uh, the cuts that we cast, uh, some handset type, and it's all locked up uh, with the help of these uh, pieces of furniture. Uh, this bed moves back and forth and back and forth and at the same time, this the cylinder is rotating around in this way. In uh, this pot is the, the ink. This is the ink reservoir. The ink is transferred from the pot to rollers. And once the printer gets his first copy off and sees if there are light spots or dark spots, he can turn these uh, nuts here, the wing, 
uh, wing nuts and uh, regulate the amount of ink that's going into each segment of the paper. Now then, as soon as he's set up, his press is moving back and forth, uh, he gets up there and starts uh, feeding. But I might interject here that uh, in the early days, this press was upstairs over uh, next to the grocery store there, and the folks told me that whenever they started this press, that there was so much vibration that they could always tell when the presses were, the press was rolling because the entire uh, block would quiver. And so uh, we don't operate it in here for, for that very purpose, not wanting to bring the walls down upon us. Now the operator, uh, when he was feeding the press, worked up here and sometimes he wore his printer's hat while he was working around here and I'll just put it on temporarily to show you. These were made for hundreds of years and it's to keep the ink out of the, the printer's hair. Now with these, this old press, it had to be fed one sheet at a time. So you can imagine the uh, production that could be gotten out of a press of this type over a period of time. And he could print only one side of the page at a time. So he would stand up here and, and wet his fingers on a, a little pad that's wetted with glycerin, uh, take a hold of the sheet, move it down until it uh, could be held up in place against the drum uh, by these uh, clips or dogs, whatever one wants to call them. Then as soon as that goes in there, rotates, uh, it is printed by the impression of the inked uh, forms and the cylinder pressing against them. The paper came out the back on a table. Then the whole business had to be brought back up here. Two new forms put on and the uh, other two pages uh, printed. Then it was ready for folding. You'll end up with a, with a page like so, which is a reproduction of whatever is on uh, this form. And that's for uh, November 16, 1973, the last issue uh, put out on this, paper, on this press by the old Palouse Republic. But when the, the paper has been printed and it comes up uh, on the, uh, the main drum, it's then transferred to this reel. It's a set of uh, about uh, eight wheels. Then this gate-like device moves up and down against these <coughs> wheels on the reel, picks off the paper and deposits it down either onto a, a table or onto some surface that has been laid over the uh, paper folder, and this is the paper folder. Then after the second printing of the other two pages, the paper is taken off the press, transferred to the, the folder, and the folder is made up so that it has two blades, one long blade that uh, will push the paper down, fold it in the center lengthwise, then it goes down below, picked up by a set of belts, moved over uh, to the other side there, and another blade comes down at right angles to this one, folds it in the other direction, and it's then ready for uh, mailing or selling on the street, as the case may be. And that's the, about the end of putting out the paper. Most of the newspaper shops couldn't very well survive without the uh, job printing business, and most of these little country shops had a press such as these. These are dated in the late 1880s. Uh, these are your job presses, sometimes referred to as f finger nippers, uh, and as I operate you'll see why I could easily get that name. Uh, these two are just about alike except that uh, this one uh, can be operated in three ways. That one can be operated just in, the, in uh, two ways. This can be operated either from a, a shaft, uh, an overhead shaft by means of pulleys and a belt going to the ceiling to, to an overhead shaft or by means of a, an electric motor uh, to which is attached a, a heavy belt of this type or it can be operated by, by foot power. 
and when it's operated by foot power, it's called kicking the press, in the old printer's terminology. And so the man gets it, it operating, and I'll show you and I'll feed here in a moment, but uh, this is the way it, it would go. The, op the, the rollers uh, were made of glue and glycerin, and sometimes glue glycerin and molasses, and, and formed just like one would form a, a candle in a, in a candle mold. Uh, this disc is the inking disc. The ink was taken with a, an ink knife and spread on the, on the disc like this, making a pretty attractive mess up there. And then was distributed by means of the of running the the press over it a few times. So this will this will have to be done to distribute the ink, but it had to be uh, distributed in this manner in order to get an even uh, layer of ink on the on the paper when the time came. That'll be a heavy impression because I got two sheets. There we are. Okay, well now what you're going to see now is the equipment that you've been viewing in the museum. You'll now see it in action at the uh, Gazette in Kendrick, Kendrick, Idaho. <laughs> what Mr. Roth is doing now is feeding the paper one sheet at a time into the press and from time to time he'll wet his fingers on a little bit of uh, glycerin that he's dropped on the, the uh, paper stand there so that his uh, fingers won't slip when he moves the paper into the, the press. And as soon as he gets his entire run through with these two pages, he'll take the forms off and replace them with two more forms for two additional pages. He'll simply have to turn the, uh, bring the paper up and uh, run it through again to get the other two pages. As you can see, this is quite a, a change, or rather, you should say, it's quite different from the uh, modern presses, which run out uh, thousands, 40, 50,000 uh, complete page papers an hour. Here he has to do them one at a time at the rate that you see here. And this is the culmination of a full week's work of uh, setting up linotype material, handset material, and uh, any other things that he has to put in, cuts and so on. So th this is really the, the end of a full week's work.